Hello everyone. In this video, we'll be discussing additive and multiplicative principles. And the first principle to discuss, of course, will be the additive principle. And uh, I'm actually going to generalize this um, in, here in the same board. But the additive principle here says that if A and B are two disjoint events or sets, then A or B can occur in M plus N many ways, where M is the amount of ways A can occur and N is the amount of ways B can occur. Now, just to emphasize this word disjoint, I uh, referred to this before as mutually exclusive. It means they share no common event or element if they're sets. So sets and events are kind of used almost in, in the same light here. So an event, for example, could be um, that a, a car is red or something like that, or um, or an animal is a dog. That, that's an event. I know this sounds kind of weird, but it depends on the context of the problem. Uh, for example, here I have some examples of drawing a card. So a card being a king would be an event, for example, or a card being a spade uh, would be an event. Um, but in fact, you can think of this as a set as well, a set of all possibilities for uh, K, right? There are four kings in the deck, king of spades, king of hearts, king of diamonds, and then uh, King of, um, king of clubs, or how many spades are there? There's 12, one for each, or I guess 13 really, one for each um, each rank, right? So there's an ace of spades, two of spades, three, four, five, six, all the way to 10 of spades, and the king of spades, queen of spades, and the jack of spades. Okay, so think of it as an event or a set, that's fine. But disjoint means they have no common element, okay? Their intersection is the empty set. So if that's the case, then the uh, amount of ways A or B can occur is the amount of ways A can occur plus the amount of ways B can occur. So I'm going to write this in, um, in red here, that this basically means that A union B has a cardinality of the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. Now this is assuming that these are disjoint sets. What if these are not disjoint sets? Well, believe it or not, if they're not disjoint sets, there also there is a formula. So this actually generalizes. It's a little more complicated, but um, it's, it's not it's not too bad. Basically, what you do is you subtract the total amount of elements they share in common because that would be double counting. So I'll actually um, write that when we get into the next example. But for right now, let's work at this example. So this asks how many ways can a king or a queen card be drawn from a standard fifty-two card deck. So here there are four choices for K and four choices for Q. The amount of kings and the amount of queens are disjoint sets. Like if you were to look at all the kings and look at all the queens, none of those cards are the same one card, which I know sounds weird, but there is no card that is a queen and a king at the same time is what I'm saying. Okay, so for that reason, the amount of ways you can draw this or this is four plus four, which is just eight. So eight ways. That's the answer. Adding the amount of ways for each one because it's an or. Or corresponds to union. It's a pretty key thing there, okay? And now what about this one? This is a little different, okay? So this is how many ways can a K king or a spades card be drawn from a standard 52 card deck? So this is different because if you look at all the kings and all the spades, there's actually a card that they share in common. There is a card, believe it or not, that is a king and a spade at the same time in that namely as the king of spades. Okay, so really what we'd be doing is if we counted all four kings and all 13 spades, we'd be counting the king of spades twice. So if you discount the king of spades, then there'll be a total of this plus this minus one many ways of doing that. So there are four ways to count kings, four ways to draw a king. There's four or 13 spades to draw from, and then we're taking away that one king of spades that's counted twice. King of spades is counted here, and a king of spades is counted here. This is counted because it's a king, and it's counted here because it's a spade. So discounting one of those gives us a total of 17 minus 1, or 16 many ways total. Now the generalization here is that the cardinality of the union of two sets is the sum of the cardinalities of those sets minus 
the size of the intersection of those sets. So here this is assuming that um, the intersection is not the empty set. But notice, even if the intersection was the empty set, this would still hold because the empty set has a size of zero. So that would basically just make this minus zero and turn into that. So in fact, this is a more general statement. And if you think about it, the, uh, the, the set of all kings, the size of that is four, the set of all spades, the size of that is 13, and the intersection of those is just the king of spades, the size of that is one, there's only one king of spades in the deck. Um, so then if you just add, you get literally this, four plus 13 minus one. Okay, so with that being said, that basically sums up the whole idea of the additive principle, and now we'll move on to the multiplicative principle. Actually, before moving on, I want to ask this question. What about when you have three sets being uh, unioned? Is the answer different? And actually it is. So the rule I showed before only, of course, works when you take the union of two sets, but with three sets, um, there's a reasoning that will help actually concoct what this is. So let me just first explain with the intersection, or not intersection, but with the union of two sets, we had the size of each of those sets, size of B plus size of A, minus the size of their intersection, right? Right. But now the visualization here is that we have these two sets A and B in this kind of Venn diagram, and here is this overlap. So basically double counting. So if you were to count all of the sets in A, that's this shading in red, and if you were to count all of, this, all of the sets in B, that's this shading in blue. So anything that's shaded both in red and blue was counted twice, right? So you would take that away, and that would give you the amount of things in the union. So that's the idea there. But now, what about when you have three sets? When you have three sets, the most that can happen, and, and basically the Venn diagram, what it will look like, is the following. You're kind of this trippy picture. We have this. So this is the most, um, most amount of times you can have intersections of three sets like this. So each of them intersect one at a time, so B with A, A with C, and B with C, but they also all intersect together. So I'd have to use three colors here to make it, uh, to do justice kind of like I showed here. So let's again do A in red. B in blue. And we need another color here for C. I have a green, luckily. So how would this formula look for three sets? So first off, we have this idea that we're just going to add those, um, the cardinality of the sets together based on this. And that certainly is true. So let's add uh, the size of A, B, and C. But then let's take a look at to see what is double counted based on the overlaps. So if you look here, we've double counted what is colored twice. So what's colored twice in uh, red and blue is the intersection of A and B. So we're gonna take that away. Also, blue and green is counted twice, so that's the intersection of B and C, and A and C, red and green, is counted twice as well. So the intersection of each of those one at a time. But now what's interesting here is that we actually have this guy that is actually colored three times. So what that means is we kind of removed our double counting but there's something that's triple counted. So we actually need to add that back, funny enough. So now we add back the intersection of all three sets. And this is the crazy formula for the cardinality of a union of three sets. So that's what that will look like. And you can do something similar for four, but the Venn diagram gets kind of crazy. But this is the thought process and how you kind of go about justifying um, these sorts of formulas involving the cardinality of unions of sets. Now we can move on to multiplicative principle. Okay, so the multiplicative principle here says, if A can occur in M many ways, and each possibility for A allows for exactly N ways for the event B, then the event A and B can occur in M times N many ways. And you may suspect intersection to, uh, to kind of make an appearance here. Um, just like union was for uh, the additive principle, you would expect this to be intersection, but it's not actually quite intersection. There is a way to discuss a multiplicative principle with intersections, but uh, the only way you know to do that would involve what are called independent and dependent sets, meaning that um, you know 
if A and B are events that actually can occur, it depends on which order they occur. And uh, I don't really want to get into that here. So instead what I can say is that if you recall the Cartesian product, we can say the cardinality of the Cartesian product A cross B is equal to A in cardinality times the cardinality of B. Now just to recall what the Cartesian product is, it's a set of all ordered pairs of the form A comma B, maybe I can write like little A comma B, such that A is from A and B is from B. So this is actually the definition of the, uh, the Cartesian product A cross B. So the cardinality of that is just the product of each of the, the sizes of those sets. Okay, we'll actually see that in this first example here. In the second example, we'll see a different kind of method that I call the slot method, which I think will be kind of fun to see. But first, let's uh, not get too ahead of ourselves and focus on this. So this is asking how many functions are possible, should have written are possible, So how many functions f from the domain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the set a comma b comma c are possible? So remember that a function assigns values to each thing in the domain. So our domain here is 1, 2, 3, 4. So then uh, 5. So here there are actually five events. For each event, there's a total of three possibilities. So you kind of see how the wording works here. Each possibility for A allows for exactly n ways. So the, uh, the possibility for A is either 1 through 5, right? And for each of those, there's three possibilities. So we have a choice. This can either go to A or B or C. Because of well-definedness of functions, we have to pick exactly one. And we can say it doesn't go to anything because then one would not be in the domain. So there's three possibilities. Three choices for this one, three choices for this one, three choices for any of them. Since there are five things in the domain and three things in the codomain, there's three choices for each choice, or for each element, I could say, of the domain. So it's a total of 15 many functions. 15 functions. So how I'm getting this number 15, of course, is just multiplying five times three. Now, a nicer way to see this, I think, based on the idea of the Cartesian product, is that you can think of, um, almost think of graphing. So if you think of this as a function, where this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, where here we're pulling numbers from the domain, and here we're pulling numbers from the codomain, which I know sounds weird because A, B, and C are not numbers, they're letters, we still have a total of 15 different possible, um, possible points you can pick. So one can be one of these three points, two can be one of these three, three can map to one of those three, four can map to one of those three, and five can map to one of those three. Basically what we're doing is creating a grid that represents a Cartesian product. So this is actually the uh, set of things, something comma something, where this can be from the set one, two, three, four, five. And this second guy can be from the set A, B, and C. So think of like X value comma Y value. This is exactly what that is. So a total of five possibilities here. And for each of those five, you have three possibilities. Total five times three, many possibilities. Okay. So, um, for this next example, I want to use kind of this idea, but it, it'll be a little more intuitive. So here we're being asked, how many alphanumeric combinations with five letters followed by two numbers are there? So think of like a password or even a, a good example, I think would be a driver's license plate. Now, um, like we like could see on a car, for example. Now, um, so I, I'm here in California. So in California, there are, I believe, a uh, number three letters and then numbers for a normal car. For trucks, I think there are letters and, um, or there's numbers and a letter. I'm trying to think if I'm, uh, yeah, numbers and one letter, but here there's three, no, three letters in between. 
So you have a number, three letters, and three numbers. But for like a, something like truck, um, that would have one, one letter, either in the second um, character or the second to last one, from what I've seen anyways. Now, of course, you can actually um, request to have whatever you want on a license plate. So that's just an example. But this is what you would get if uh, you have no special request, if you're just driving a normal car, a non-truck car. Have a number, three letters, and three numbers. So seven characters total. And you can actually use the method I'm going to use here to find out how many combinations there are. But for this particular problem, that's not the case. For this problem, we have five letters followed by two numbers. So each of these are letters. Okay? And these two are going to be numbers. Now, we need to figure out, so, so first off, each of these are events. So there's actually like seven events here. So we have to figure out how many different um, possibilities you have for each event. So for letters, these can be any letter between A and Z. And if you don't know, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. So there's a total of 26 possibilities for the first value, 26 for the second, 26 for the third, 26 for the fourth, 26 for the fifth. What about numbers? Well, numbers, single digit numbers, there's zero to nine, okay? Now, I probably should have stated that, followed by two single digit numbers or something like that, but if you're creating a password, that's kind of what would come to mind. So there's a total of 10 possibilities here, right? If you count one through nine, that's nine, but including the zero, there's now 10 possibilities. So now if you multiply these, this is what I call the slot method. So for each number, it represents a slot that would have that amount of possibilities. Then you just multiply them all together. Okay, now this is gonna be quite a large number. This is 10 to the second times 26 to the fifth. I will try to plug this into my calculator and see what I get, but I suspect it's not going to be a very nice answer. Okay, so it gives me a value. It's very large, by the way. So let me try to write it here. It's 1188. One, three, seven, six. Followed by two zeros. Those two zeros come from the 10 to the second, which is just multiplying by 100. Um, so if you want to separate these of each three by a common to figure out the size of this, it's about a billion. It's a billion, 188 million, 137,600 ways, or 600 combinations, I guess you can see, just to go with the wording a little more. Okay, so that does it for the multiplicative principle, and actually that does it for the entire section here on these principles. So I hope we all took something uh, away from, from these ideas. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of applications here when you actually count uh, certain things. In fact, these are known as counting, um, I guess, counting techniques, you could say. Some of these may have been pretty obvious. You may have encountered before just kind of thinking about certain things. But it's nice that we have them laid out and actually worded now and defined as principles. So with that being said, I thank you all for watching. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you in the next one.